Welcome all of you to this live program at Orthopedic Principles. Today, our guest of honor is Dr. Bertie Bo from Oslo, Norway. Dr. Bo is a consultant orthopedic surgeon and the head of the arthroscopy division in the Oslo University Hospital with a special interest in shoulder and knee surgery. She defended an orthopedic PhD at the University of Oslo in 2012 and has been invited to several national and international meetings as speaker and faculty member for both knee and shoulder surgery. She is currently the Vice General Secretary of ESCA and also the President of the Norwegian Society for Shoulder and Elbow. She's an editorial member for AJSM, CASTA, ESCA Academy, and VD General Sports Medicine. She's a committed member of ISACOS and also serves as Norway's, Norway's National Delegate for the European Shoulder and Elbow Society. She's involved in the peer review process for arthroscopy and the Journal of ISACOS and also a member of the AJSM Electronic Media Board. So today is my great honor to introduce you to Dr. Bertie Bo from Oslo, Norway. Over to you, Bertie. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for this invitation and the possibility to participate and talk about one of my favorite topics. Uh, we, we discussed different topics, but we agreed on um, talking about the arthroscopic latache, uh, which is a procedure that is uh, challenging for most of us still. But of course, we get curious and um, a lot of surgeons are thinking about it, maybe to switch from doing the open procedure to go to the arthroscopic. So I will uh, tell you about our experience. It's a most practical um, lecture. Uh, so here we go. I have some disclosures. So why should we even bother to change to arthroscopic? Well, we are many of us sports medicine surgeons that tend to prefer the arthroscopic procedures. So converting to arthroscopic has in history been natural for us. It's a development and we, um, evalu uh, we uh, develop our skills in arthroscopic surgery. And I think that most of us wouldn't even think about going back from Bankart and Kef repair to do it open again. Most of us do this uh, only um, with arthroscopic techniques now. And for the latache, it's also more easy for us to treat the concomitant injuries uh, when you do it arthroscopically, because um, uh, people are having trouble with instability. They often have uh, either a heel sucks um, a lesion that you also want to treat or some other labral lesions, maybe posterior or slap that you also want to treat at the same time. But I have to admit, doing the latache procedure arthroscopically is quite technically demanding. So the steps for the open and the arthroscopic procedure is of course approximately the same. You have to do the preparation around the coracoid and the osteotomy of the coracoid. You have to do the split in the subscapularis to place the graft on the anterior uh, glenoid. And you have to, have to prepare the anterior glenoid and of course, in some way do the fixation of the coracoid to the glenoid, either with screws or with endobatons. So when we started back in 2014-15, we first visited some experienced surgeons. So one of those who uh, is famous for starting with arthroscopic latage is Laura Lafosse, and uh, we visited him, him in Annecy to see how we did it first. And after that, of course, it looks easy when he is doing it, but we went to wet labs several times to do the procedure uh, for ourselves. And you know that sometimes when you're in the wet lab, the specimens are not so big. So when you're trying to do the latache and work in the subdeltoid space and underneath the uh, pectoralis major, um, there's sometimes very difficult because there's leakage of fluid and it's not so easy to expand that room because that's different with the latache compared to other um, intraarticular shoulder procedures that you need to work in a room that it's not in the joint. So sometimes this gets even more difficult in the wet lab than in the real life. But anyway, you have to practice. And we were also lucky to have an uh, experienced colleague when we started up uh, in Sweden, Dr. Koshnow had uh, been doing this for a long time and he had um, uh, several cases. Um, so he um, volunteered to come and help us for our uh, first two cases. And I'm very happy that we, we, we uh, 
uh, invited him um, because um, uh, even if you were two skilled surgeons working together, um, there are some difficulties uh, for the first cases. And that's uh, the next point, as you can see. Uh, I worked on this together with my mentor, Tom Ludvigsen, and we were always the two of us uh, for the first procedures. So we decided to follow our patients closely when we switched from a well-known recommended technique, the open latache, to an arthroscopic procedure that not many of my colleagues were performing before. So we wanted to see that this was safe and as good as the open procedure. So we evaluated all the patients with clinical scores and also preoperative CT to evaluate the bone loss. In the theater, we tried to copy what Lafosse and Dr. Kushnow had shown us. So even if I do all other shoulder surgeries in lateral decubitus, we started to do this procedure in beach chair. And as you can see from the pictures, um, there are different positions of beach chair. Um, the one to the right in the lower corner is much more lazy beach chair than the other one sitting upright. So uh, because there were some concerns about um, uh, cerebral, blood, cerebral blood flow, we uh, had the monitoration of it and we also did the start of the procedure with the patient sitting and then when we switched the scope from the posterior portal to the anterior portal we uh, changed the position so the patient was more in a, in a lazy beach chair and that was totally fine for the technique we also give the patients tranexamic acid i don't know how much it helps but it's really important to not have bleeding during this uh, procedure because then you will not be allowed to, to continue and uh, it will make everything uh, very difficult. So you also have to be friend with your anesthesiologist so they keep the blood pressure stable and low. And um, most of the cases, at least in the beginning, we also used muscular relaxation uh, for the latest part of the procedure when we wanted to uh, push the coracoid through the split in the subscapularis. We did not give it before because we wanted to wait until we had uh, found the nerves. So after doing the procedure for um, six years, uh, I decided to uh, try to do it with the end of button technique because we had um, seen uh, with the screws technique that we had more resorption than we thought of the coracoid. And then sometimes the screws, the head of the screws, they were um, with no bone around them and they looked like they were into the subscapularis. And for some of the patients, we had to remove the screws because um, they had some tenderness either in the front around the subscapularis or uh, if the screws were a little bit long, uh, some of them had pain uh, in the infraspinatus. So now uh, the latest uh, months I have switched to uh, lateral decubitus. Uh, I'm doing the procedure with endobutton technique like Poilot and I switched from using a 30 degree scope to a 70 degree scope. I always bring the 30 degree scope into the OR uh, still because I want to have the possibility to go back if I think something is difficult with the 70 degree scope. But of course you can do more of the procedure with the scope in the posterior portal when you have the 70 degree scope. So this are the portals, uh, the same as um, uh, Boileau use north, south, northwest, and west. All these portals I have used for all the procedures. However, I have noticed that I don't always need the east portal. So I don't make the east portal in the beginning. I wait and see if I need it. Because Bolo is using this portal to the second spreader in the subscapularis. However, I have seen that I don't always need the second spreader. I often use a switching stick instead, either from the south or the west portal. So 
uh, last Monday, I had a case. Uh, actually, I had scheduled two cases because I wanted to make some movies from the uh, operation, uh, both for uh, for a course I participated in last week and for this presentation. So I wanted some high quality, nice uh, videos. However, the first case was um, cancelled because of COVID, and this is the second case. So this is to remind you, this video, that these are not primary cases. They are often patients who has um, dislocated several times, and when you uh, go into the joint with the scope, you see that they might have concomitant injuries, and they might have other reasons for their pain and and discomfort than just the luxations so when we start the procedure you follow the upper border of the subscapularis uh, remove the soft tissue in the rotator in the interval and you follow the subscapularis from lateral to medial uh, because this will guide you to the base of the coracoid and if you go this way and do the palpation with your electrocautery device, you will find bone and the undersurface of the coracoid. When you find the undersurface, you can remove some, uh, some uh, fatty tissue there. And also you can move on the superior part of the, subs of the coracoid. Uh, and uh, on the tip then, you know you will find the coracoacromial ligament that has to be uh, released. And uh, you go all around the, the coracoid, and this is still with the camera in the posterior portal, because it's a 70 degree scope. You're able to see the coracoid, the tip of the coracoid. Down to the right now, you see the subscapularis going into the humeral head, and we are releasing further down around the conjoint tendon to make it possible to move the coracoid after you have prepared it. So when we have released uh, most of it, uh, we, have, we are still with the camera in the posterior portal, but then you have to move your electrocautery device from the northwest or the west portal to the north portal. So you can cup directly down on the medial side of the coracoid. And this is the side of the coracoid that is uh, dangerous for us, that not so many of us easily go to. So from this north portal, we have to stick to the bone with the electrocautery and release the pec minor. And with the 70 degree scope, you can most of the time look over the edge and you can see that you release the pec minor from the tip of the coracoid. So here first, the electrocautery in the north portal, releasing without seeing so much, but you're still on bone. And then to the right, you see the tendon of the pec major released, and you release a little bit in the, in the um, spatium between the conjoint tendon and the pec minor. And you have to go all the way so you remove the tissue around the coracoid so you later can see your burr coming through and and uh, your sugar clamp when you're going to burr so this is underneath the coracoid and you can see the rasp and you need to uh, make the surface under the coracoid a kind of flat so it will fit to the anterior glenoid without being oblique uh, in the placement so I try to use the rasp to make a flat surface and uh, often close to the conjoint tendon, there's a little tip of the bone. So not without making any injury to the tendon, you have to go all the way distal and then proximal to make this flat surface. And then you can place the sugar clamp. And there you see, I have also an illustration. So it's more easy for you to see how you should place it because it has to be uh, perpendicular to the flat surface uh, because that's where the end button is coming through. So with the sugar clamp to guide you, you drill through uh, with a drill bit with a sleeve with a, uh, around it and you have to drill all the way so the sleeve come through. So watch out for the tip 
and, and hold the soft tissue away so you can see that you're not going too far with the burr. And then with the sleeve in the coracoid, you can pass a PDS suture. I like this blue suture because it has a totally different color and it's easy to find. And uh, with the blue PDS, you can pull the end the button through the coracoid. Then the button will be placed on the top of the coracoid. And all the white sutures that are going through the glenoid uh, will be taken out to the north portal. And first you see I take the small blue and white suture out in the south portal. And this is a way to hold the sutures out of the way uh, before you, you do the osteotomy. To do the osteotomy, and also for the rasp actually, even if it was not in the video, I used this half pipe to make, um, to make a safe enter for the saw because you are not allowed to go around in there with the saw before you find it. So I used the half pipe to know where I'm coming. And then you can see the sutures are, are tight and we used the saw to do the osteotomy. Um, this is for the end of button technique that I have started to use the saw before um, with the screw technique, we used a chisel. So this is, a picture with a 30 degree scope where you have moved the scope to the anterior part. So you look directly on the coracoid. So this is how we did it when we did the screw technique. And you can see it's maybe a little bit easier to see that you are central in the coracoid. And it's easier to see when you release the pec minor. So also there are some beneficials with this technique. And I also brought this picture to remind you that if you think you don't see enough from the posterior portal, you can always switch to, an, to a more anterior portal to get a better view of, around the coracoid. And as I said, if you don't have this saw or if you um, prefer to do this with chisel, you can of course do that. Then I will recommend you to first make uh, a small uh, this, a small start of the osteotomy from underneath before you go through with the chisel from the superior side. Because if you don't do that, chiseling of the coracoid will very often end up with a spike underneath. So this is the chisel from the superior uh, part after uh, you have done it from the inferior side. So after preparing the coracoid, placing the endo button, uh, I go back to the joint and I still have the camera in the posterior portal. And at this time I mark the height of the glenoid approximately three o'clock. So I know exactly the height because when you move your camera to another portal, it might be a little bit more difficult to know exactly the height. I think all of us are most used to having the camera in the posterior portal. And then after marking it, um, I have to remove uh, soft tissue from the anterior part. Most of the patients where I do Latache, they don't have very much labrum left because it's revision cases or people who has had several dislocations. So I am not, um, uh, I, I do not always repair the soft tissue in front there. Most of the time I remove most of the labrum. Before I then use the rasp again, this is the same rasp as we use underneath the, the coracoid to make this uh, flat uh, surface. This is the half pipe showing that I use the half pipe to get safely in with the rasp and making this flat surface as I talked about. I also start the split in the subscapularis from the joint side. Here's the camera in the back. You can see the subscapularis, the upper border, the head of the humerus. And I had made a weakening in the subscapularis um, to show me the way uh, later on. Then it's time for the guide. The guide comes from the posterior portal. So this is the first time I move my camera to the Northwest portal, looking from anterior superior. 
And I also used the half pipe to get the guide into the joint. And then it's the height again. You want to be flush with the glenoid. You can see we have prepared the anterior part of the glenoid. You can see my mark of three o'clock. So we know the height and you can also see that we have enough bone distal to the uh, guide. And I use the guide with one drill, some use with two, but this is Boileau's technique with just one um, drill hole. And it's the same as you did in the coracoid, a drill bit with a sleeve around it. And you have to drill all the way so you can see the sleeve before you remove the inner part of the burr and remove the guide. So now you see the height of your endo button and then uh, remove the guide and place the spreader using the half pipe again. And, uh, and you, you use the spreader approximately in the same height as you had your uh, drill bit. You can see the drill bit behind the spreader there. And you then go one to two centimeters into the subscapularis and then leave the spreader there. And then you go on the anterior part of the subscapularis to identify the axillary nerve. So you know exactly where it is before you go all the way through the subscapularis with your spreader and open it. This is the same scenario just with a switching stick and not a spreader. I forgot to film exactly this part. So this is from another patient, but you can see going through with this with the switching stick or a spreader, often quite close to the nerve, but you have seen it, you know where it is, you protect it. And then when you have the switching stick or the spreader in this position, you can safely open the subscapularis lateral to this uh whizzing rod or switching stick so here without a spreader opening the subscapularis with the electrocautery and here is uh, uh showing what you sometimes see when you get through your split you can see there's a little bump in the bone and i then remove the bump because i really want the anterior glenoid to be flat Here's uh, the, uh, the same patient that we had in the beginning with a spreader that we have opened. And you look from anterior through the subscapularis split into the sleeve of the glenoid right there. And you can see the spreader is holding the split in the subscapularis open. And uh, often you then have to clean up a little bit more. In this case, you can see there's a small piece of bone. So... This was the rest of uh, all the bunker fracture that I also had to remove when I saw it from anterior. And you then use the PDS again. At least that's what I use. You can use a suture retriever as well, of course, but it's more easy with a blue suture so you don't mix up with the other sutures. And you then um, uh, pull the blue sutures out the same opening as the white sutures from the end button and then pull the coracoid through the split in the subscapularis. And in the beginning, it's often a little rotated. So you have to help it a little bit through the split and help it with the position. And at this point, uh, so far, I have switched my scope back to the posterior portal because I'm more familiar with this portal and I want to be sure that the rotation and the position of the graft is okay. And you can then go with some instrument or a switching stick to, to push the graft uh, in the right position. And when you do this, uh, when you got the right position, you want it to stay like this. So it's time to uh, tighten the sutures. And you then put the posterior and the button into the four sutures and make a knit knot, very simple knot, just a single half stitch and then put one of the loop into the other. So it will be a gliding, sliding knot and um, tighten it a little bit before you pull. And this will lead the, the posterior button and the knot into the posterior uh, glenoid. After this, you put on a tensioner 
and uh, it's a little bit sound of this so you can hear the tensioner uh, and I then follow on the screen tension to 50 adjust the position if you have to and when we're happy we will tension to 100 and palpate if the coracoid is stable if it's stable and you like the position you release it and I tend to tighten it several times because I have the feeling that sometimes it's not stable after just one or two times so I do it several times until I feel it's really stable and I then secure it with three more half stitch knots so a few comments about the graft placement you can see this is a video from when we did the screws it's a uh, very um important that the graft is not lateral so we often use the switching stick from posterior to palpate to see if the um graft was too lateral and if it was we removed it uh even you had to to uh, replace it uh, but sometimes if you felt it was just a millimeter or two you could remove some of the bone with um with a burr So when we start to do this procedure, and I still do it because I've learned so much uh, from it, uh, we did a post-operative CT scan uh, the day after the operation of all of the patients. Because if you don't do it, sometimes you might have placed the graft too lateral, and then it might be a disaster for these young patients. After doing more than 100 cases, we wanted to... Um, go through the, the material and publish how it was for us to, to learn this procedure. So we compared the first 25 cases we did with those cases we did after approximately five years of experience. So that was approximately from case 75 to 100. Uh, most of them were men, of course, and in our material, 19 of these 50 patients were re-operations. And all of them had several dis dislocations. So the results showed um, no significant difference in age. You can see that the surgery time for the first 25 cases was more than two hours. And, uh, and um, as expected, we lowered the time some to one hour and 45 minutes for those cases we did after four or five years of experience. So I have to admit, I, ha I had expected that we should lower the time even more, but this is the facts. And uh, clinical results after one year, which is very early for instability patients, of course, is quite similar in the two groups. Uh, about complications, it's uh, always a fair of complications. And we know that the latergy procedures uh, have high numbers of complications also for the open surgery procedures. So, uh, we were surprised we had so much bone resorption after one year. That's not uh, maybe a complication because, uh, because the clinical results were often very good, but, but that was surprising for us, I have to admit. Uh, the major complications are those who needed a re-operation. And in the first group, there were four patients who, who were re-operated uh, during the first one, one and a half year. This was one deep infection uh, that was rinsed and then he was uh, treated with antibiotics and and he has recovered well after that two of them was so stiff that we did an arthroscopic arthrolysis and they became much better after that and the fourth uh, he needed a screw uh, removal because of tenderness uh, over the head of the screw and in the last 25 patients that we operated there were one who needed a reoperation and that was actually uh, a fracture of the graft that we saw um, some days after the operation. We were not able to see totally in the first CT scan. We saw that there was uh, a partially fracture, but we um, but we did it. The graft was in place, and we didn't have to do anything with it immediately. But then suddenly one day he had more pain, and we did another CT scan, and we saw that there was a fracture of. of um, of the graft so we had to re-operate him with open surgery none of them have had the recurrent dislocations uh, 
but three of the patients in the first group uh, have had subluxations. And that might be because of a little bit more medial placement of the graft. Of course, we, we gained experience and the placement of the graft was probably better in the last group. So the lesson to learn from this uh, um, learning learning curve or evaluation of our, our own learning is that you should never be afraid to call some of your friends. And it's a good thing to visit experienced surgeons if you have the possibility to do that when you start a new procedure. And also, of course, practice in wet lab. And I also thought it was very beneficial to invite an experienced colleague to supervise my first uh, cases. And I also advise everybody to follow their cases, at least the first cases with a CT scan afterwards, because you should absolutely avoid turning young patients with instability into young patients with osteoarthritis. Thank you so much. I will uh, stop sharing my screen then. Thank you, Bertie, for that spectacular presentation and congratulations for the cutting edge work that you do in Oslo. Thank you. Great. Uh, but a few questions from our side. Uh, but do you think there's a risk for a neuropraxia for any of the major nerves, for example, the axillary or the musculocutaneous? Have you encountered any of those? Uh, we have had some neuropraxia afterwards. It was, uh, by coincidence, it was none in these groups of 25 that we that we had in the in the paper. But we have had some in between. We have had non serious neural injuries, uh, no axillary injuries. We have had uh, paresthesia of the musculocutaneous nerve. And uh, one of them still have reduced power in the, in the biceps, uh, but it has recovered partly. And uh, he has, of course, uh, been to, to neurography and EMG, and he has been. Um, we are not doing nerve surgery. So I sent him to a colleague who's doing nerve surgery and asked if uh, there was something he would advise us to do with this young uh, male. And he said, no, we just had to wait and, and see if it recovers. And it, it's, it has recovered partly, but that is, that is one of them. And we now have more than 150 cases. And I, I was really afraid to get injury of the axillary nerve because that would really be a disaster so we go and find it go and see it every time even if it lengthens the operation sometimes 15 minutes sometimes maybe 25 minutes because i want to see it i want to know where it is and if you think about the open lattice procedures that many surgeons perform i don't think people go and look for the nerve when they do the open procedure so I, I don't know what's I don't know what's right, but I felt when we were starting to do this procedure differently and we were afraid of the complications, I, I felt it was right to to see the nerve, know where it is. And um, so far it's been good. No, no injury to the axillary nerve at least. And of course, for, for some open surgeries in Latashi as well, if you if you pull on the coracoid to prepare it, you can also get a traction injury of the musculocutaneous nerve. Mm -hmm. Thank you, buddy. And of course, your complications are much lower and most of them are recovered. So that's great news. Yeah, but, but it, is, it is a concern generally with the, with the Latashe. And, and uh, of course, in the beginning, depends if you count bone resorption after one year as a complication, the complication rate would be very high. But as I said in the presentation as well, even if you see that the bone block is almost half of the size, uh, the clinical results could still be perfect. So, so maybe that's the loading of the graft that you get resorption where the graft is not loaded and that the half of the graft is big enough because some of the coracoid that you place there is more than two centimeters long. So, so maybe you don't need that big graft. So that's the wolf's law comes into place, isn't it? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> and buddy, uh, what about your, I mean, you have some 150 cases and how many of them were screws and how many of them were buttons and was there any difference? 
In in the paper or where with screws? In, no, so in, we, in, in we, your yeah. in your series, not in the paper. In your series, in, your no, in my, my series, uh, we did approximately 150 cases with screws first, and then switched to endobatten technique this spring. So with the endobatten technique, I have uh, between 12 and 14 cases now. Okay. So, and, so yeah, what do you think is the advantage of the endobatten? I think, I hope that uh, we will not need to remove any metal because I have had patients with some tenderness anterior or posterior if the screws has been long. Uh, so, so I hope we don't have to reoperate any to remove any metal. Uh, you can also see some cases where, for example, if the patient has epilepsy, Seizures, you can see some cases of broken or bent screws. If you have cases where the screws are bent, they're very difficult to remove. Um, and I think that head of the screw, uh, if you have a lot of uh, osteolysis, this will be screw heads going into the subscapularis, making irritation. I don't think the small round end of button will do the same thing. Um, so, so those are the main reason I have switched so far. So, but of course, I will have to also look into the results of the end of button cases. Maybe when I have done twenty five, <laughs> and compare to the screw patients, and then I will have to decide which one I think is better for me. Thank you, Bertie. Bertie, we have a lot of surgeons, shoulder surgeons on our channel who already do the open lethargy. So what is your advice to them to, while before switching to an arthroscopic? Um, if they if they decide to switch, well, I, I, I like the procedure and I will not go back. I, I, in fact, I did, a, I did an open one today, but that was because of uh, some uh, practical issues in my hospital. Uh, and you know these muscular huge guys it's sometimes very difficult to get in there in the right position also in the open procedure so i i will not go back but um i'm lucky to work in a public hospital where i were where i was able to do this together with an experienced colleague and we were allowed to spend two and a half hour for the first cases uh, so I know it's totally different if you work alone in a private practice. So uh, my, my tips and advice would be to, of course, uh, visit surgeons who's already performing the procedure and um, get experience in the wet lab um, and, and start to work around the coracoid because a lot of people are doing AC joint stabilizations, for example. And, and if you can use some of these cases to get a little bit more experience to work around the coracoid with your arthroscope, you can kind of take it stepwise. And another way to do it stepwise is to start with arthroscopy and do um, the steps in the joint uh, arthroscopically with the guide from posterior and placing the sutures in the glenoid. And you can then go and open up, harvest the coracoid and do it with endobuttons as a combined procedure. I think that might be easier in the beginning than to do the whole procedure by yourself because uh, either you need a really skilled assistant or you need another orthopedic surgeon to do it together with you because you, you two hands are not enough. <laughs> thank you, Bertie, for that. Uh, thank you, Bertie, on a different note, I just want to, I mean, you're a great achiever. You're the Vice General Secretary Veska. You're the President of the Norwegian uh, Shoulder and Opposite Society. I mean, it's a moment of honor and prestige uh, to have you on our channel. And of course, we have a lot of women surgeons, aspiring women surgeons who want to become orthopedic surgeons, who want to become shoulder surgeons like you. And they are many of them are on a channel. And yeah, as you know, uh, in this part of the world, the number of women surgeons are even less than five percent. So, what do you? What is your message to all of them? Uh, all those young, upcoming women surgeons who want to really uh, make it big in orthopedics. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> um. Of course, they are very, very welcome. I think it's good that it's uh, getting more of us. Uh, 
and I think one one of the things we can do that are already here is to do things like this to be visible. Uh, so so I will encourage them to send in abstracts and try to be uh, visible. Don't don't be shy. Don't be afraid to. Uh, participate in discussions and to give lectures and to uh, be eager to to develop your skills both practical but also in in research and presentations uh, because you have seen also in a lot of orthopedic meetings there are only men on the stage and uh, uh, I think there are enough clever and skills females that all congresses, all meetings should make room for at least one. Uh, so what what female can do well, um, try to take responsibility, um, try to go to courses where you can uh, network with other colleagues. Uh, of course, there are some challenges with family life, but it's it's not impossible. So, but you also have to, you have to leave your house in a mess sometimes <laughs> and you have to leave your children to others because it's very difficult to become a surgeon if you want to work part-time or if you all the time need to have the perfect house and, uh, and to, to spend a lot of time with your children. So, so it's a balance there, of course. Thank you, Bertie. It's very nice to hear those wonderful words. And uh, thank you so much, Bertie, for joining in. It was a fantastic and fabulous presentation. And I'm sure it's going to benefit a lot of people. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's so nice. very nice to be here. Thank you for 